Um, there's been some nice conversations about the projects. Those are all looking quite in interesting. So good job on that. If you need to talk any more, I'll have office hours Thursday, too, for any last minute things. But it's due Friday. Um, PDF via Canvas. I think I have an assignment up there. And submit um, a single PDF file with your document for me. And um, there's no rules on formatting, et cetera, but it should be you know, professional quality document report. Um, and you uh, hopefully have gained some of those skills in your undergraduate. But if you have questions about that, uh, Specifically, I can answer those two. Any, any questions about what exactly has to be turned in to the, for the project or anything else there? The proposal? No? Okay. Um, and I had somebody ask me too, yeah, how long does it have to be? It just it needs to be as long as it needs to be to explain what you want to explain. And uh, there is uh, value in being concise and uh, carefully wording things to make them easier to understand. So uh, that's vague, but uh, you'll find uh, you know, lots of journals that you submit to will have page limits. And you might have two to five years worth of a story to tell and just a handful of pages. So you want to keep, try to be concise and, um, and get to the point and uh, think carefully about um, you know, what are the main um, points that you want to express and then foc focus on those and don't, don't uh, drift off into other areas. Okay? Any other questions there? Um, and um, we're pr probably, th you probably should be at least through about half of the pro problem set two, I think. I think we're around, around that. I think problem. Two seven will we will correlate with what we talked about today, so maybe if you're almost to that, um, you're you're sort of in in line with the class material. Okay, so last week we ended a little a little abruptly with this um, example that I had of a ice skate. It had a velocity of P and N. I think that's what I called it. I'll call this N. And I just called this X and Y. And the angle between that ice skate and the horizontal and the x-axis um, theta. And this ice skate, right, we wanted to model an ice skate. An ice skate, if I uh, stick an ice skate in the, in the ice and try to push it laterally, it, it's not really going to want to move, right? So it has this uh, no-slip condition on the lateral mo motion. Um, but as, we, as you know, an ice skate can still make curves. We can have lateral motion. So the, the modeling choice here is that... Um, if you want to move laterally a little bit, you also have to move forward. And in that motion constraint um, was that the tangent of theta equals y dot over x dot, right? So that relates, relates the velocity components of that point P in a way that um, um, if you have motion in one direction, you're always going to have motion in the other direction, according to that rule there. We rewrote that as tan x theta minus y dot equals zero, right? And then the question was, um, is this a non-holonomic constraint? And I want to write that. Or a holonomic constraint. What's the definition of a holonomic constraint. What, what has to? What does a holonomic constraint look like? And what makes it? What makes it a holonomic constraint? Chris. Okay. 
So it's only a function of, I'll say, generalized coordinates. Um, any constant values, I'll add that in there, and then time equals zero. So there's no velocity terms in there. But we see velocity terms here. And um, the method that we showed to try to check, um, if, I have a, if I have something that has velocity terms in it, how could it, how could it possibly be this uh, form if this has no velocity terms? Is there, is there a... Um, I don't know if I'm asking that question exactly like I want it, but uh, if I have some function that also has velocity terms on it, is it possible for it to be a hol holonomic constraint? Or is it always a non-holonomic constraint if it has velocity terms? If it's integrable, right? So. If I can integrate this equation f that has velocity terms, and I end up with an equation that only has positions, I mean coordinates, generalized coordinates, then um, it is in fact not a non-holonomic constraint. It is just a, the derivative of a holonomic constraint. And in our case, if I think about uh, well, what would be the derivative with respect to time of f, you can write this as the partial of f with respect to these three coordinates, x dx dt plus partial of f with respect to y dy dt plus the partial of f with respect to theta d uh, theta dt plus the partial of f with respect to time if it's explicit. In our case, it's not explicit explicitly listed here. And if I compare that equation to this equation, I can match terms and see that tangent of theta is the coefficient to dx dt. Right? So partial of f with respect to x equals tan theta, excuse me. And then this term, which is a negative 1, is the term that is um, the coefficient to y dot here. So the partial of f with respect to y equals negative 1. And then finally, I, we don't have this term or this term in the equation. So partial of f with respect to theta equals 0. Partial of f with respect to time also equals 0. OK, so I can just match terms and sort of find if, this, if I know that equation is likely to f fit this form, if it's integrable, there's one thing that has to happen, and that is that um, all mixed partial derivatives have to commute if df dt is integrable. If I can spell integrable in Okay, and I showed last time that um, if we check for the partial squared f partial of x partial here, this is equivalent to taking the partial with respect to x of the partial of f with respect to theta. Right, and if I do that, I have the partial of f with respect to theta is 0, so the partial of 0 with respect to x is 0. And then I can also check the partial squared.
squared f of theta with respect to x, uh, with respect to theta, and then and with respect to x in that order, and that is equivalent to so the partial of f with respect to x is tan theta, and then if I take the partial with respect to theta, I get seeing it squared theta. Okay. These are not equal. Not equal. Thus, non-integrable. Right. And what that means is, is that this equation we have, this constraint equation, um, let's, uh, so x dot tan theta y dot, mi sorry, minus y dot, equals zero is an essential non-holonomic constraint. Right? A motion constraint. <clears throat> now, um, any questions there? sort of rushed it at the end last time. But if, you, if you make the assumption that the, part, the uh, time derivative of f is integrable, we can assume this form and use this um, rule of calculus. Um, I think it's called the Schwartz integrability. Integri integri I can't say the word integrability theorem or something like that that says that these mixed partials have to commute for that thing to be a differential equation like this to be integrable. And you can check that out, look that up on your own. But this is a quick way to, um, reasonably quick way to see if that's an essential, essential constraint. All right? So um, <clears throat> what does that mean for us? Well, we had three coordinates. Right? Does anybody not have this sheet? So we had three generalized coordinates, and they were x, y, and theta. And we have one, excuse me, motion non holonomic constraint. So what this implies is that uh, only two of the, G of the generalized coordinates can move independently. <clears throat> so if we define a few variables here, if we let m equal the number of non-holonomic constraints, n is going to be the minimum number of generalized coordinates, right? So this is um, any extraneous coordinates eliminated with holonomic constraints. That's right, uh, already eliminated.
And then finally, um, P is going to be N minus M. And what P is, is what we call the number of degrees of freedom of a system. Right? And I abbreviate that as DOF sometimes. Okay? So we can, if you've gotten hold of the minimum number of generalized coordinates, you can describe the configuration of your object or space, and you've identified any essential non holonomic constraints, um, and you subtract those constraints from the, the number of coordinates, you get P, and P is the degrees of freedom. And that corresponds to that only, in our case, only two of the GCs can move independently. Right? So, generalized, uh, I mean, uh, non holonomic constraints reduce the number of degrees of freedom. Right? The more you have, the less degrees of freedom, the fewer degrees of freedom you have. And in our case with this skate, um, we might have assumed that it might have three degrees of freedom, but this motion constraint removes one, and then we only have two. Right? It can um, move in the plane, but the, sort of the angle is always going to be governed by, or the x and y are always going to be governed by the angle. And you can choose which one you want to be um, independent or dependent. So for our example, I need to turn this to tablet mode. For our example, for the skate, we have um, B equals 3 minus 1, right, 2. 2 degrees of freedom. And uh, another way to state this um, in, the, in the word with some... Um, New words we'll use use often is that uh, the number of a lot. This is the number of velocities that can change independently at any one instant. Okay. And what else do I want to say there? I can also say or the number of velocities needed to um, characterize the motion. Now suppose that there are p independent speeds, independent velocity, then The remaining m velocities can be calculated with all right at the bottom. I'm going to come up here. Can be calculated with a relationship that looks like this. Okay, so this is a matrix equation where this is a 
vector or column matrix of independent speeds, independent velocities, and this are the, these are the um, vector of dependent velocities. And then we have U1 through UN are total number of velocities. And then we'll have that R will go from P plus 1 to N, which would give a total of M items. Right? And what this, the key aspect of this equation is that um, the independent speeds are related to the dependent speeds in a linear fashion. Okay? So if that's a matrix A populated with um, things that have the uh, coordinates and the constant values in your, in your system, as well as BR, um, that will provide a, a linear relationship to, if I have the independent ones, I can, can, I can find the dependent. And we'll look at that more specifically in just a minute. Any questions there on this non-holonomic constraint? Right there, the motion constraints, degrees of freedom. Does anybody not have that sheet? Okay, let's think about a little example to frame, frame this. Um, I call this a disk or a thin disk. Rolling without slip. on a sphere. So, if I make a sphere here and the first thing I want to add is I'll add some axes. So this sphere is uh, fixed in this case. And we'll call it, uh, this is the sphere S. And there's a point somewhere on the sphere where this thin disk will touch the sphere. And we can locate that by some vector here. And If I project this vector down into the plane, I could introduce a couple of coordinates. We'll call it uh, phi here, and then this angle theta, all right, that will locate that, that point on the sphere. All right, so two coordinates get us to the, the point on the sphere. And then <coughs> this uh, plane that I, this square, this uh, dotted blue lines, which are hard to see up there. Huh? Sort of define a plane. <coughs> and if I imagine that um, this thin disk is up here on the plane and some rolling, I mean, rolling on that sphere that uh, if I look at the point tangent to there and I project the um, plane of the disk into the sphere, I could imagine some angle 
we'll call it gamma, um, that, the, that the disk's projection into that tangent plane has with that um, line, or this blue line. Does that make sense? All right, so the sphere is, the uh, disk can sort of twist there. And then if I also look directly onto the sphere, I'm saying directly um, onto the disk, like so if this is the surface of the sphere, and I've got my point P and my disk would then look like that, maybe. If I look directly into, um, normal to the plane of the sphere, of the disk, then there's also a, uh angle if this shoots back to the center of the sphere, there's an angle we can define right here, which I'll call beta. All right, so we can sort of, on the sphere's surface, right, it, gamma is like this orientation, and then beta is this orientation on the surface. Chris? So is gamma the Yep, you could, yeah, if you call that disk a, vehicle of sorts, you could call it a yaw angle, right, in, in the terminology of vehicles, and uh, and then beta, your lean, lean angle too, right? Does that make sense? So, yeah, I should have had a little, had a little demo, but there's the surface of the sphere, and I can stick that disk on there. Gamma gives me that, so I gamma over, and then beta to, to lean it, flop it back and forth, okay? And then it can be touching anywhere on that sphere. There's one more coordinate. What might that be? We want to know, in, ca uh, in this case, the full configuration of the disk relative to the sphere. And there's one more, one thing we're missing. What would that be? So this disk, um, you know, I can grab it and rotate it and stick it on the sphere any way I want. So there's some rotation angle of that um, disk about its um, about an axis that uh, would be normal to the plane of the disk. So if I draw the the disk and I think about a line fixed on the disk, right? then point P, it's touching point P somewhere here, and I could have an angle, I think they called it um, alpha, there, right? So some line fixed on the disk, what's the relative angle between it and the line that goes from the center to that contact point? So do you think now that we can fully describe the uh, the disk's configuration relative to S with those coordinates. It's a, it's sufficient in this case, and I want to call this uh, D. Call the disk D, and um, so. 
this point P, called the contact point P, uh, is an interesting point to to sort of look into. So. Um, Where is P? Um, what I'm going to claim is that at any instant of time, point P is fixed in D. So, <clears throat> If you think about this, the sphere, and I'm standing in the sphere and I'm watching the contact point of this thing as it rolls around in the sphere, I could trace out some point on the, sp on the sphere, some, some path. Right? And that, right, that's point P. <clears throat> and then, um, if I'm on the disk, standing on the disk and it's spinning, you know, I can, I can stick a point on the edge and, it, and every, it'll, it'll, rotate and hit the disk every once in a while, depending on how fast the, the disk is spinning. So that's, that's not point P. Mm -hmm. Point P is this point that's always located at the contact point. So if I'm standing on, di on the disk, P is just going to look like it's going around me, right? At uh, the rotational angle of uh, alpha, the rotational rate of alpha dot. And what do we know about, if you think about a disk like that just rolling in a plane on, on a table, what do we know about that point P that's always at the contact point? Is there anything special about its motion? What's the velocity of point P in a simple um, planar disk rolling? This P that's always at the contact point, but at any instance is fixed in D. If I have a disc rolling like that on, on the ground, with a velocity, its center has just a velocity of v. What's the velocity of q? And I need one more dimension there. And that's r. Chat with your neighbor for a minute and, think, and see if you guys can come up with what is what's the velocity of a point Q, point P and Q that are fixed in an instant of time, always at the very top and always at the very bottom. If the center has a rightward velocity V, that you're a little crooked. Oops. Chat with your neighbor. Yeah, what do you think about this? What are the velocities of Q and P?
Got any answers there? What do you think? What's the velocity of Q? And I'm going to add a, an O here. If we're standing on the ground watching this thing. Doesn't move or the wheel move. They stay at the topmost point and the bottommost point of the wheel at all times. So any instant of time, Q and P are always in those locations from this view. Say it again. V, so you think the velocity of Q is V? Um, they do, you know, if I just uh, tracked that from the perspective of the, um, the ground, but maybe I didn't frame this question exactly like I wanted it. Um, if, <clears throat> what is the velocity if I'm, st say I'm, say I'm standing on the point at the center of the disk, I have a velocity v and n. We'll call this n. Right? And if I walked out to point Q at, at, at that given instant of time, would I have the velocity V? What would it be? Would it be greater or less than V? This is always this is conceptually hard, and maybe I'm doing it a doing it injust I'm doing an injustice on asking the question precisely. R v. R cross v. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's write. We what is omega of the disk? V over R, <clears throat> right? And if I know that V of O in N equals, um, let's say, the magnitude of V over an O in N is this V. Uh, actually, I'll just write it. Let's write it explicitly. V of O in N equals V times NX, right? We all agree there? V of O and N. And if we want V of Q and N, we can write the um, V of O and N plus what? Omega of disk D, D and N cross R, right? Is that, we believe that? So this tells me then that we have V in X plus omega cross R. Well, omega is into the board. And if I cro R would be pointing up to the Q point, if I cross it, um, uh, into the board, into there, then I, I also get it in the same direction as B. Right? So that's going to be omega R in the uh, in X direction, right? Now, 
Now, what's omega r? Do you believe that? Now, with that in mind, what's the velocity of p? Zero. All right, so this is 2v, zero. Okay? So that's a key thing. Um, in these rolling without slip things, um, we can imagine this point fixed at that location in the instant of time in D. And, um, and then if you look at the velocity in N, uh, in fact, the Q there is twice the velocity of V, and v, P is, has a velocity of zero. Okay? So this, these two facts are potential motion constraints. Right? I've got some expression for velocity, and I say it, equal, it has to equal this, other, this value, right? It's, it's now constrained to be a certain value. So for our disk on the sphere, we can um, write back to the velocity of p in, what did I use, s, okay? There's slip. We had a planar problem here, but if we have a 2D, now we have a surf, it's rolling on this surface, and it could slip in the direction it's rolling and laterally. We can imply this, uh, that point P can't move in any, either, either direction, right? It can't move in those two directions. So the velocity of point P has multiple components, but in fact, it always has to be zero for the uh, 3D case, right? So that there is um, a potential motion constraint. Right? So I listed a bunch of coordinates, right? We had five generalized coordinates. We had, uh, I lost one of my variables, phi. Phi, theta, uh, gamma, beta, and alpha. Right? We said those set the configuration there. And um, this velocity, this constraint with respect to P and S, it actually is, um, how, ma how many constraints? Is that just a single constraint? If P can't slip in two directions on the disk, I've got two constraints. All right, so there, if I expressed this in the plane, the tangent plane of the sphere, right? If I had a coordinate system that was in a uh, reference frame that was tangent to the sphere that, mo that moved around with P, I could express that slip in these two directions. And I'd get two components of that. So this is uh, actually two motion constraints. So we have M equals 2, right? N equals 5, P equals 3. Numbers of degrees of freedom of that system if you have rolling without slip. Right. So it only needs, it only has three independent ways that it can move if we add that motion constraint in. It's going to add two motion constraints. We'll see this more explicitly. We'll do an, an example fully. Um, one, one last thing to say here is that uh, you could also say, well, what if the, um, now say I have a new reference frame, and I have the sphere S, and, and it has the disk on it. Now, what if um, S can 
fully move and rotate and in. Think about that question for a couple minutes. Chat with your neighbor. What would M N N P be? We still have a disc rolling with slip on the sphere, but the sphere is maybe like Earth in relative to some other planet or something. How many, raise your hand if you think M is zero. Two other people. <coughs> Not a lot of confidence. Anybody got other ideas on M? Two. Same thing, right? Yes. Disc rolling without slip gives us those two motion constraints. What's N? No, total number of generalized coordinates with this new system. So we got a sphere, and if I rotate that sphere, one angle, and then um, rotate it another angle. Sorry, it's three. How many? Three. Three. All right, so if I have an arbitrary object, like this pen, I can spin about this axis, that axis, and this axis, right? So rotation is three dimensions too, right? Every angular velocity vector has three Thanks. So this uh, rotation is also 3. So we got 3, 3, and 5 equals what? 11 total. All right? So uh, this is 3 plus 3, I guess. 
position, and rotation. And then what is P? Nine. All right. So this exercise um, is what you often have to do with any given system, right? Trying to find the minimal number of uh, generalized coordinates, as I mentioned last time, and generalized speeds is an art, sort of an art. Um, it's not always obvious. Um, you can systematically write down the motion constraints like we did, like all the coordinates and then the motion constraints. But with practice, you'll also just get a feel for identifying how many degrees of freedom a system has, right? Um, after you do enough, like my arm, if I locked my um, for, uh, upper arm in place, imagine maybe I have, this is one degree of freedom if I just do that two degrees of freedom, and three, right? How many coordinates do I have to be able to lock that in place? Depends on how many, right? And if I move everything else, I can start counting more and more joints. And this is a bad example, too, because we don't have perfect pin joints in our, in our arm. There's also, I can shift my, um, you know, my, if I took my leg, I could also shift the other one. So you want to conceptualize this motion. And in general, if you think about all the coordinates, you'll get the total number of generalized coordinates. And then different motion constraints, though, are more tricky. And you're going to have to think about those and how they reduce the degrees of freedom. OK? Questions there? Um, let's take a break. If you want to give me some feedback here, tell me what you didn't understand. You can go to this again. During the break, come back at uh, 10, uh, 10.58. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely talk about that. Even if, even if it's not correct at the moment. That's fine. Talk about what you think the coordinates are. Okay. Talk about what you think the reference frames might be. Talk about, now you can talk about maybe what you think motion constraints might be too if you have those and degrees of freedom. Especially if you want to reduce this. Yeah. Yeah, talk about that. It's, uh, we'll s remember the, uh, I think I showed you at the beginning of the class the bicycle equations of motion took up all these pages. Um, that model had uh, it has a uh, location right over the bike, those two two coordinates, and then it has a lean of the bike, right? It has a pitch of the frame, so now we're up to four, and it has a steer angle, five, and then rotation of two wheels, six, seven. So seven generalized coordinates can set the configuration. But if you think about rolling this, two, you can subtract two for each wheel. That's minus four. So then you have the three degrees of freedom. That three degree of freedom system took 30 pages of uh, equations of motion. So they really get out of hand quickly, even with small numbers of degrees of freedom. So if you want to keep the scope um, more track tractable, uh, you could you could do the bicycle and that kind of that, that system's doable in this class. Um, there's been a few people that have done that one, and uh, but that is uh, just a, an anecdote about how quickly they blow up when you add lots of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs>
Okay, so no feedback today. Everybody got all that? Don't be shy about sending me some feedback notes there so I can talk about or uh, improve anything that needs to be helped out. Okay, <clears throat> any questions that you had over the break there? Degrees of freedom, non-holonomic motion constraints, generalized coordinates, and um, holonomic constraints. So <clears throat> let's talk about a few things here to uh, move on. So one big question is what happens to the system that you're interested in as time progresses? Okay, um, the generalized coordinates are functions of time. And you could write them in a column matrix form, for example. We'll call it Q bar is uh, Q, whatever, Q1 all the way to, sorry, these are um, scalars, right, Q1 to n, right? n generalized coordinates, and uh, I leave the t out, the q bar is a function of time, right? Change of the time. And we, we really want to, this is typically what we want to know about any system, like what is its position and orientation and uh, configuration at any given instant of time. <clears throat> but N Newton discovered that f equals ma, right? And A, well, that's Q, um, well, let me not write that. F equals MA, right? And A is related to Q double dot, right? So if I knew the time derivative of both, all of those coordinates, um, I could express accelerations in terms of those. Um, so that means that to get Q bar from Q double dot, this equation we have above, we have to integrate twice, right? And we go from uh, Q bar double dot to Q bar dot to Q bar. So we're trying to write that expression, f equals ma, in terms of these generalized coordinates, the double derivatives of the generalized coordinates. And once we have that, um, integrating it twice can potentially get us back to what we're interested in as q bar and how, the, how q bar changes through time. Um, so what this means is that uh, we need to keep track of of n independent generalized coordinates and p independent I'm just going to call them uh, uh, velocities here Right. And P can be less than or equal to N. It may seem obvious to um, use Q bar dot and let me q bar dot to track the motion. 
but um, it's not necessarily the desi most desirable choice. So what we've, we've talked about so far hasn't really been specific to um, what's called Keynes Method, which this book um, that, we, that we're working from talks about. Uh, but this is one of the aspects that makes it stand out. If you did, um, if you formed equation F equals MA with the Newton-Euler approach, right, you probably learned in Dynamics 101, or if you've, uh, how many people have used Lagrange's approach to forming F equals MA? Nobody seen that? So <clears throat> there are a lot of approaches to get to F equals MA, and they all have little different differences. And um, some of them are more suitable for other things. And um, Keynes' method uh, makes this pretty clear. In Newton Euler method that you use in Dynamics 101, you always, you can always choose Q dot, right? So position X, I just choose its velocity V, and that's going to be the variable in my equations of motion. And um, same thing in Lagrange's method, which you, none of you guys haven't seen yet, but um, I'll try to say a few things about that a little later in class. Um, but it turns out you don't have to always choose just the time derivative of the coordinates as the variable to keep track of. And it becomes beneficial because it can sort of reduce the complexity of the equations if you don't, if you choose differently. So with that in mind, um, rather we can use something called generalized speeds, okay? So we had generalized coordinates. Now I'm going to make an explicit definition of something called generalized speeds. And these um, are equivalent to Q bar dot, but we can uh, express them in a different fashion. So consider a system S whose configuration in some reference frame M is completely defined by a minimum set of um, generalized coordinates, right? So we've got our minimum generalized coordinates defines the configuration of that system, and they look like Q1 to Qn, right? T N minimal generalized coordinates. Um, we then define a set of N scalars, and I'm going to call these U1, to U N as the generalized speeds. Of S and N. Okay? And they can only be generalized speeds um, if two things. A, each, sorry, each UI, the I view, is a linear combination of of each QI. And to write that mathematically, ui equals the sum from j to equals 1 
to in some matrix, call it Y, capital Y, IJ, <coughs> times the Jth Q dot plus a remainder term we'll call Z, big Z, I. And that's for I equals 1 to N. All right? So here we have any given U is some linear function of the Q, of the Q dots, right? And it may be function of all the Q dots or some of the Q dots. But if you can express your U in that form, we can call it a generalized speed as we're defining it. And then the other aspect is it must be possible to solve the above equation for all of the Q, all of the Qs. Given the U's. Oops. All right? And to put that in mathematical form, you can write Q dot. All right, I can solve all the Q dots here. Sum J equals 1 to N of uh, little y KJ. UJ plus little z k, k equals 1 to n. All right? So there's this linear relationship, and this implies that this matrix Y is invertible. Okay? So y i j must be invertible right, for that second thing to hold. And, a, and also a note. Um, oops. I want to get a little more room here. Let's see. Um, I wanted to note too that uh, Y, I, J, and Z, I are functions of the Q's in time, right? And uh, I don't have a good variable of that for um, in constants. Okay, so you can find. These are arbitrary uh, matrix functions of these variables. And yi is invertible so that we can easily get q dots if we define some expressions for the use. Questions here? So we get to depict what the U's are any, any, any way we want as the, as the modeler, as the dynamicist. Um, as long as they fit the, these two rules. And then um, it turns out that they often can help you, help you out. Everybody got, anybody not have this page? So what does this look like in practice? We're going to have a uh, plain, planar motion of a simple rigid body. So I'll uh, define a reference frame in here and some arbitrary rigid body 
It has a mass center. And I'm going to fix a coordinate system. This is going to be B. So we'll have B1 and B2. And I'm going to locate, I'm going to add some coordinates in here. We'll call this Q1. <coughs> this variable that locates that, we'll call this Q2. So we locate the center of mass, and then we'll call this angle Q3 that gives the orientation of that rigid body in the plane. And then I'm going to call this point B star. It's the uh, as the center of mass, and I think that's all we need here. So similar to the ice skate, but this time I'm not going to have um, the motion constraint, right? It can rotate, slip, and slide any direction. It's just like having a sheet of ice and this block, and you s send it around on that sheet of ice. So a few things, right? I can write uh, V1 equals C3 N1 plus S3 N2. And uh, B2 equals negative S3 N1 plus C3 N2. So I can express these body fix references to in the N frame with those. And then we can write out a few terms, right? So I've got angular velocity of B and N. It's just simply going to be Q3 dot N3. And N3 and V3 are the same, so we get Q3 dot V3 there, too. The velocity of B star in N is simply Q1 dot N hat, N1 hat, plus Q2 dot N2 hat. So that's the velocity of B star in N expressed in the N frame. So we had a Piazza question that popped up. I haven't had time to answer it. It's, that uh, is related to this. But I also have this reference frame B that's the body fixed reference frame. So we have this body fixed reference frame B. I can. You know, this has a this B star has a velocity in N. I can express it in B if I want, right? So I could express the body fixed velocity. It's still velocity of B star and N, but if I replace N1 and N2 with my relationships up here, I'll end up with Q1 dot C3 plus Q2 dot S3 all times B1 plus Q2 dot C3 minus Q1 dot S3 B2. So this is the body fixed velocity. All it is is I've expressed the velocity of B star and N in the coordinate frame that's attached, always attached to the body. And I think the Piazza question was asking about, well, why would I, something about I was expressing an angular velocity in terms of the, the reference frame of the body, like this body B. I got also right, I did that right here. It turns out that they're the same in that case for those simple rotations. Uh, but that's fine. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with so all it means is, is that if I'm standing uh, in N watching this thing, but uh, thinking about what that velocity vector looks like always from the B in the B frame, um, it's going to look, it looks 
it's still the same vector, but it's always going to be ex um, have these components if I reference it from the B frame. And the body fixed um, angular velocity and velocity of things is, is very useful. It's often a very convenient place to um, actually do your analyses from. And, and one reason is, is this. I, I could write this velocity of B star and N as U1 B1 plus U2 B2, where these two things are my generalized speeds. Right? I chose them. You get to choose them any way you want. So in this case, I'm going to say that U1 and U2 are generalized speeds. Now, does it meet the two criteria? Well, U1 equals Q1 dot C3 plus Q2 dot S3. And U2 equals Q1, Q2 dot C3 minus Q1 dot S3. Does that meet the first rule? That the U's are linear in the Q's? Q dots? Sorry. Yeah. So the linear coefficients, I could write that as in matrix form, U1, U2 equals some matrix times Q1 dot, Q2 dot. And I'm going to get C3, S3, and negative S3, C3. All right, so I have a linear, a linear in the Q dots. So that meets that. And then what's the second rule that it has to meet? B from the last, second, previous page. Has to be invertible. All right? So can I solve for the Q dots if I have the U dots? All right? Is that invertible? What do you think? Is that invertible? Yeah, this is invertible. Um, you know, you could... You can solve the equations um, just by moving everything to the right but one of the Q dots and then plugging it in the other. Or you can use Gaussian elimination with this. Um, or Kramer's rule right, for a simple 2x2. Uh, two two. And a 2x2 two two, uh, inversion is, uh, is simple. right? So if I call this y, y inverse, then is going to be C3, C3, right? They just switched, but they're the same thing. And then negative S3, S3, I think, all over the determinant C3, C3 minus S3, S3. Is that right? If I'm remembering my 2 by 2 correct. So that would give you an, the in, inversion of that, and that is all um, valid there. So we have defined correct generalized speeds. They're valid. And we can solve for the Qs. Right, I'll just write those out, what they would be if you finish this out. And this uh, right, just equals to 1. And then I'm going to choose one more generalized speed that uh, U3 simply is Q3 dot. That's a simple definition. Now, what does this do for us? If we've got the velocity of B star in A, um, What is acceleration of B star in N? Uh, 
Acceleration of V star in N is going to be, we could say it's the acceleration of V star in V plus the um, omega B and N crossed with the velocity vector, V, V star, and N. Am I doing that? I didn't, I didn't write that right. This is the acceleration of V star um, time derivative of the vo velocity vector, oh yeah, NB. Plus the angular velocity of B and A crossed with the B star in B. That's what I'm doing wrong. Right, so we can write this derivative out like that. And then we have um, the time derivative of the velocity of V star. I still think I'm saying this wrong. Velocity of V star, this is the time derivative of the velocity of V star in V dt, and the velocity of V star with respect to B though is zero. What am I doing wrong here? I'm making this up wrong. Start over here. It's the dv v star and n dt, but we can write that out as um, that's just but that's just. Uh, V B star and B plus omega V and in, in N crossed with V B star and B. Is that, is that that's what I want. Cross with B star and N. V Using myself and forgetting my rules. All right, we know alpha b in n equals, in our case now, we have this new definition u3 b dot, u3 dot b, 3. And um, What rule do I want to use here? This is the velocity of V star and N plus omega B and N crossed V star and N. what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Confusing myself. The time derivative was in the B frame, okay? So I can rewrite, this is the, I'm forgetting my uh, extra in there. So this is the time derivative of VB star in, right, in the in frame. But I can also write this as 
the time derivative of VB st v star in, in the V frame plus this omega cross uh, V term, which I've got a big mess here now, which you can't read. Omega V and N crossed with V B star and N. All right, is that believable? That's what I was screwing up. Write your, always forget, always remember your um, uh, full notation here. But this is the time derivative in N of V B star and N, right? That makes sense. And then here, I can write it more simply, I can write it in this form if I take the time derivative in B of that same vector and then I add that cross product term. So now, I can say A B star in N equals, well, I have V B star in N expressed in the B frame. So all I have to do is U1 dot V1 plus U2 dot V2 to get that time derivative. Pretty simple. Plus omega of B and N sticking out of the board, crossed with the velocity of B and N has two components. So we've got um, U3 V3 crossed with U1 V1 plus U2 V2. And then we get U1 dot V1 plus U2 dot V2 plus, um, if we do that cross product out, we're going to get um, U3, U1, and then B3 crossed into B1 is negative B2, I believe. 1, um, 3 into 1, negative B2. And then um, plus U3, U2. And B3 crossed into B2 is going to be negative B1. B3 into B1 is, po is positive. All right. Until I'm uh, <coughs> losing composure up here. All right, does that look right to everybody? My U1 disappeared. U1 dot V1. And then if we write those together, we get U1 dot minus U3 U2 B1 plus U2 dot plus U u3, u2, b2. All right. So I think that's right now. So the, the message that I want to come out here, though, is that picking these u's, right, if I kept um, the definitions, or did I write my u, u equals? If I plug those u's, u1 and u2, into this equation, it gets a, it's a lot nastier, right? It, um, and if I were to, if I had expressed, um, if I had done this, right, if I had all those u terms written as these q dot expressions, um, I've got sort of a nastier thing to deal with. So what? The choice of those two U's conveniently made this a little nicer and simpler to handle. Okay? And you're going to see this commonly right in the A accelerations and the angular accelerations, which are what you need for F equals MA and, um, and then Euler's equation. So with judicious choice of generalized speeds, 
you can reduce the complexity of the acceleration expressions. All right, that's, that's what I wanted to come out of there. Sorry for getting bogged down um, on that. Okay, any questions there? So that's uh, the gist. I don't want to say anything else. Um, I'll just add this note that uh, in practice, generally choose the UIs, all the U's, to be components of velocities. And or angular velocities. of points or bodies of physical of physical interest or, or significance. Okay? And um, Note that you can always choose that you want UI equals QI. That choice of generalized speeds is always valid, but you get more complicated expressions in general. Um, choosing different U's can help um, decrease the complication of that, of your accelerations. All right, that's what I wanted to say right there. Questions? So you as the modeler get to choose the generalized speeds and you can pick them, typically measure numbers of different velocities or angular velocities are good choices. They have to be linear in the Q dots. And you have to be able to invert that matrix to recover the Q dots. Um, and if that's the case, uh, it can help you out in the long run when you equations. And one other thing that I forgot to um, say was that um, these equations, u i equals the sum of y i j q i plus z j. There's a name for these. They're called the kinematical differential equations. Or kinematic. Kinematical or kinematic. All right? And they're called, kinem they have the word kinematic in them uh, because they only have to do with. Um, velocities and coordinates, right? There's no, um, we haven't got the forces and torques and uh, inertia, et cetera. They're, they're strictly about the kinematics. And then they are differential equations. I've got a dot right there, right? And they're differential equations because, like, this is a differential equation, right? I have Q dot equals some function, and they are differential equations. All right? Okay. I think that's what I want there. So we've got, what, 12 minutes left. Um, hmm. I'm not going to be able to get through the example I want to do, I don't think. Due to 
bungling on the last one. Um, let's say, let me say this note. So we've been talking about these motion constraints. <laughs> And um, even if all the cues is a minimal set, the generalized speeds that you choose may not be independent. Right, these were the motion constraints. Um, we'll make them, make some of them dependent, uh, if you have those. Important to note that this is a property of the system. In question, um, not the choice of use. So you can pick any generalized speeds you want, and it's not going to change anything about the motion constraints. All right, you still have those fundamental motion constraints. You're just going to write them in a different set of uh, in a different form. Um, and the next bit is uh, if. If there are no motion constraints, if there are no motion constraints, um, all n of the u's of the generalized speeds are independent. And the system is a holonomic system. With n degrees of freedom. All right, so if we, no motion constraints, then you're going to have n u's that are all independent. And that's going to mean that P equals N because M equals zero for the number of motion constraints. And then a uh, simple non holonomic system is subject to um, motion constraints. that look like you are, right, the dependent speeds these are system, n degrees of freedom, all the u's are independent in a simple non-holonomic system. Um, the u's are not independent. Right? You have some dependent u's and some independent u's, and uh, the degrees of freedom are reduced. Right? And here you have DOF is uh, P equals um, N minus M.
right? So that's that's motion constraints. Um, I'll do an example Wednesday, and and then we'll talk. Maybe say a couple more things about them, uh, but depending on the system that you're working with, you may or may not have motion constraints, and um, they complicate the problem. Um, right? You get this set of equations, and ultimately, um, you can write this in matrix form too, and you get, and you might have to invert um, that to find the. Um, if you have expressions for the dependent GCs. And they, they sometimes complicate your, your equations in motion. They get longer and, and everything else. But um, properly dealing with these are uh, tricky sometimes. And also, uh, just conceptualizing them are not necessarily easy. But um, we'll, we'll see as we move forward that Kane's method, because we up front state this and choose these, both the kinematical differential equations the way we do, and, and then the finding the independent and dependent generalized, which are supposed to be generalized speeds, not coordinates, that uh, we can systematically deal with them in a fashion that is, I would say, simpler and more straightforward than if you were solving this with Newton-Euler approach. Okay, and we can do some comparisons later. Um, I got just a couple more minutes. I had a cut some questions about, you know, I haven't. I've been letting you guys learn Jupiter and Python on your own mostly, and um, the. Posted a, a couple a couple things to the um, Piazza, but I want to show you if I am at the main page. Right, this is these are all the files in my in my directory, my home directory. That's your directory. <laughs> I'm like I didn't make those files. You might want to up delete your login information. Okay, so these are all my. This is my directory now. Right, all these are a bunch of files. These are folders, and then inside them are files. Somebody asked if, um, asked me in office hours, how do you download them? Well, I can click a single file, put the check mark beside it, and then up here, there's a download button, and I can save that to my disk, my my computer. Um, it's a little painful because you, have, you can only download things one at a time. And I don't think you can download a folder. Yeah, you can't. But uh, I have a little script. If you go to New Terminal, this gives you a, uh, this is a server that's running Linux. And so you have like all the Linux-based commands here. I made, we made a little script to, to help you back up your files. If I type backup home and just press enter, it takes all the files in my directory that I can see right here and puts it in a file right here called backup.zip. Right, so and you can just run that whenever you want to and then click that one file and download it. Um, Back up your files. This is we just fired up this server this summer, and um, I'm sure something will go wrong. But uh, be, be sure to back up your files as you go along, and we'll um, and that's that's one way to do it. Any other any other two minute questions on any of this stuff? Any other troubles with working with this system that you want to know about? No. All righty. See you Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Thank God. See you Monday. <laughs> <laughs> oh.